And so today we are looking at God's word in chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 9 through the end of the chapter. Now, on October 11th, coming up here, 2014, our fourth child, Alexi Jane Dawkins, will celebrate her all-important fourth birthday. <clears throat> it is hard to believe that she is four at this point. And to say that she is excited about this upcoming date is slightly an understatement. She already has a theme picked out. She is having, she has told us, a Princess Ariel birthday party, which fits because she now, uh, when she introduces herself to people, she now introduces herself as Alexi Ariel. So to have a Princess Ariel birthday party seems to make sense. She already asked Sherry Bellinger, who made the Grace Church cake, um, to make her her Princess Ariel birthday cake. Um, And she's already telling people that she's four. In fact, we almost launched World War III when we kindly told her that she is not four yet. She's almost four, but she has to wait a few months. World War III almost went off in our house. Luckily, we know how to disarm children's nukes. And so we... (laughs) Waiting is hard for a child. It's just the way it is. Waiting is hard. Waiting well is really hard. So if you're a child, you know, if, you're, if you're, I'm just going to say, if you're 10 and under here, we feel your pain. It is hard to wait well. Thankfully, as you grow up, it becomes really easy to wait well. We adults, we never throw a fit when life moves too fast. <laughs> we, we never throw a fit when the road that we're walking becomes covered with fog and we never get discouraged We love that, actually. We enjoy that. We enjoy when we've mapped out our life and we've planned the next move, the next job. We've organized the the next upcoming trip that we're going to take. And we've worked to get all these ideas off the ground. And then out of nowhere, something comes and, and everything stalls out. We just think that's great. We have no problem with that. We have no problem waiting on results when we're sick and trying to figure out what is happening with our bodies. We love it when we lose our best clients and they go to some other organization. <clears throat> Waiting is great, said no one, <laughs> ever, except for maybe the psalmist. Young or old, waiting might be one of the hardest spiritual disciplines a Christian can engage in. Waiting on God. Not just waiting, but waiting well. Waiting well on God. It is hard for me, personally, to wait. I have to admit that I don't like to wait. I like action. I like accomplishing things. I like to move. I like things to be done. I like to get things moving forward. But here's what we're going to learn from our text today as we look at the the history of the early church, the acts of Jesus through the Holy Spirit in the life of the apostles. Here's what we're going to learn today. We're going to learn that God's mission happens in God's time. God's mission happens in God's time. And sometimes God God's calls us in his timing to wait. Calls us to wait. Waiting is actually God's way of preparing us for what he has called us to in the future. Waiting drives us into a deeper dependency upon God for what he will do in us and through us in the future. We're going to see that as we look at the history of this account today. So I want you to pray with me as we look at God's word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we pray this morning, you hear our prayers. You are listening to us right now. You know every heart in this room. You know every soul. You know every dream. You know every desire. You know every pain and struggle and suffering. You know every victory. It is all before you this morning. Lord, we pray that you would help us to wait well upon you. We pray for your Holy Spirit to help us wait well upon you. We pray that you would revive us and give us spiritual life in your word and through the knowledge of your son Jesus and all that that means for us as Christians. We pray that that would strengthen us and give us endurance to wait well. So help us, God, this morning. Oh, Lord, I thank you so much that we have your words, that we're not just gathering this morning to just talk about 
our opinions about life or our philosophies of life. We have your perfect, infallible, inspired, divine word which teaches us about who you are and what you've done and how that impacts us. So help us again today. And I, I, I know, Lord, I have confidence in you this morning that you will do um, a strengthening work in our body this morning for your glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, this passage begins this morning with the disciples looking up into the sky. I'm going to back us up to verse 8 where Jesus has just charted out the mission for the disciples when he said these words. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And the cloud took him out of their sight. A cloud like we saw in Exodus, which symbolized God's presence with his people. It was a cloud like the cloud that filled the temple with the penetrating glory of God. Jesus' ascension is this incredible, miraculous, unrepeatable, true and historic event. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have been standing on that hollowed ground with your jaw dropping as Jesus is lifted up into the glory of this cloud in the sky? Well, that's what the disciples appear to be doing. Their jaws are on the ground. They are looking up at the sky when they are slightly rebuked by these two men in robes who seem to just appear on the scene. This Look at what happens in verse 10. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, jaws dropped, eyes up, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now sometimes I laugh as I read the scriptures, and I I hope you do too. Because it seems kind of funny that the first thing they would say is, men of Galilee, why are you standing looking into heaven? I don't know, maybe because Jesus just left the earth and floated up into the sky into a cloud of glory. I'm not sure if that's a good enough reason for you. Why are you looking into heaven? Because this is the glory of the ascension. It's this, this unrepeatable, miraculous, true and historic event. And yet they have a purpose for why they're saying this. These two men are angels. This is New Testament language for angelic beings. If you go back, remember Luke and Acts are companion, two-volume set. Go back and read Luke. You're going to see lots of overlap in language between Luke's first book and his second book. And he's already recorded in Luke 24, two men in dazzling apparel other translations or other gospels, two men in white robes showing up at the tomb of Jesus. And now here, two men show up at his ascension and they are, they're speaking. So what's their point in speaking here? Their point is to propel these disciples forward on their mission. Jesus is coming back. That's what they're trying to say. Jesus, why are you looking? He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back to reap the harvest that he intends to gather. The second coming is assured. Jesus is coming back, and the clock starts ticking now. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. The mission is going. It's still going right now, today. As you sit here, tick tock, tick tock. The mission is going. Jesus has come. Jesus will come again. The mission has begun. And in between these two massive events in history, the first coming of Christ, his perfect life, his substitutionary death on the cross where God placed his wrath on Jesus for us, his resurrection from the grave, and then his ascension between the first coming and the second coming when that, when that cloud will be rolled back like a scroll and the Lord will descend between these two moments in history. The purposes of God will be fulfilled in and through the church. And so the angels are prodding the disciples to get going. Pick up your jaws 
and go to work. The mission has begun. But here's the tension in the text and what I believe the Lord wants us to zero in on today. Jesus has told them first to wait. You must first wait to do the mission that is in front of you. The clock is ticking, but you must first wait. It seems like it's a contradiction. Hurry up and wait. But that's what Jesus is requiring of them. It would seem like this is an unusual decision because, you remember, these, these men have been with Jesus for three years. They have, they have heard his teaching. They have walked alongside him. They have witnessed his sufferings. They have witnessed the, the horror of the crucifixion. They are witnesses of the resurrection to new life, just as Jesus has promised. Jesus has showed himself to the apostles through many proofs. He appeared on the road to Emmaus. He was cooking food on the beach. He appears out of nowhere to Thomas. He spends 40 days with his men after his resurrection, teaching them about the kingdom of God, the upside down but right side up kingdom of God. It would seem as if Jesus leaving marks a time that now the church should get busy. Get busy. Get on with it. But first, the church is called to wait. God often calls us to wait to wait, to wait on results, to wait on change, to wait on dreams, to wait on progress, to wait on a driver's license, to wait on a relationship. Think about it. Think about how much of your life is spent waiting for something else to happen. So much of our lives are spent waiting for something else to happen. What does God want to accomplish in you and in us as we wait? From this text, I think it's simple. He wants to drive us into dependency upon him as we wait. He wants to drive us into dependency upon him as we wait. Waiting well means being driven into a a dependency upon God. That's what we're going to see throughout this passage. Pick up the story again in verse 12. Then, after this, these words from these angels, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now notice that they have gathered with Jesus We learn now that they were at the Mount of Olivet, the Mount of Olives, and they made their way from that spot back to the upper room in Jerusalem. Now, if you go back to Luke, Luke 22, you don't need to flip there, but if you were to go back to Luke 22, you would see a few different scenes taking place, and one of them would be this gathering in the upper room. This is the place where the Last Supper took place, where Jesus last gathered with his disciples for a meal. This is also likely the place where where Jesus gave the promise that the Father was going to give them the Spirit, the one whom they're waiting on, back in John 14, verses 16 through 18. So he takes them there in Luke 22 from this upper room, and he travels to the Mount of Olives, which is another name for the Mount of, of Olivet, and that's the location where Jesus is betrayed and arrested. So now they are at the Mount of Olives, and they're moving their way back to the upper room. This is a very well-worn stretch of road for them. They come back to Jerusalem to wait. What are they waiting for? They're waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? I'm not sure that they know. When will it take place? They don't know that either. All they know is that they're required to wait. Very similar to us, right? We often don't know what it's going to look like and when it's going to happen when we are waiting for God to move. And that drives us into dependency upon God. Three observations about this time of waiting. 
verses 9 through the end of the chapter. First, is that waiting moves us to prayer, or it should. Waiting moves us to prayer. Look at what they did as they waited for the promise of the Father. They turned to prayer. They prayed together. Prayer is a huge theme in the book of Acts. 31 times in the course of this volume, prayer is recorded. Prayer is mentioned. The early church was saturated with prayer. When you don't know what to do next, when you aren't sure which which way to go, whether go forwards or backwards, or which way to turn, turn to prayer. That's what we see them doing here. It's interesting. Waiting well is not the same thing as inactivity. It's not the same thing. It's not to be mistaken with passivity. Waiting well drives us into the strategic action of prayer. When you don't know what to do and you don't have the power to pull it off, you pray. It's a strategic action. It's not passive. The text says in verse 14 that they were devoting themselves to prayer. This word for devotion here has this idea of continually praying, constantly praying, regularly praying. This was not, you know, this was not like the stock prayer that you pray before a meal just you know, to make sure everybody feels good about the Christianity and so you can eat. No, this was an outpouring of genuine, deep, heartfelt prayer. That's what they're doing while they're waiting. Nobody told them to do this. <laughs> this is what they did. Why? Why were they devoting themselves like this to prayer? Why, why did they not pass the time playing board games? Why, why not go golfing or wakeboarding while you're waiting for the promise of the Father? Well, here's why. They were expecting God to move at any moment in their midst. They were expecting God to move at any moment in their midst. It's not just prayer or even devoted prayer. It's expectant prayer. God can move at any moment in our midst to give us the spirit. And so they gather together in this room and they begin to pray. Jesus taught them how to pray. Jesus taught them to pray to the Father. And so they, they've been praying and they've been led by Jesus. He's modeled this prayer to the Father. But now, for the first time in the three years of his ministry and the relationship with Jesus, he's gone. You know what it's like when you've, when you've leaned on someone and you derive strength from them and then they're gone and then you're f- alone and it's scary and it's, it's a vulnerable place to be. It's all on them. And so they begin to pray. Now, I'm going to let you into something here. Let's do the math as to where we are in the, in the story. B- because what you and I know that they don't know is that there's a short window of time between the ascension and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's do the math. Jesus says that Jesus taught them for 40 days. I know some of you are like, math, it's Sunday. We're not supposed to do math on Sunday. So this is bonus for you. Okay, so 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus taught them about the kingdom of God. We see that in verse 3. And it was three days after the, it was three days after Passover that Jesus Uh, was crucified and was in the grave. So we've got 40 plus 3. And then Pentecost is 50 days after the Passover. Pentecost meaning 50. And and so you've got 50 and 43. So there's a stretch of seven days between those two. So this passage finds itself in this week. It's one week. Now if somebody told you, all you got to do is wait for a week, you'd be able to do that. That wouldn't be hard. It's the not knowing. They don't know. That's hard. And it drives them into a deep dependency on God in prayer because like our lives, they don't know how long they're going to have to wait. They don't even know what they're looking for, likely. We don't have any record of it at least. They just believe that at any minute, Jesus could do something powerful in their life. And this is their all-consuming thought. 
Jesus at any time can break in to our lives and, and do something powerful. What might he do? What will he do? What will the ascended Lord do? Uh, the picture of the glory of Christ going up into the cloud is fresh in their minds. As they come back to this room, they begin to pray. If he can ascend into a cloud, what is Jesus going to do? Expectant prayer. And this consumed them more than anything else, more than board games, golfing, or wakeboarding. Now, I know that the times are different. We are not living in the culture of the book of Acts. We are not sequestered to Jerusalem until the promise of the Father comes upon us. And so I get that there's a unique intensity about this moment, but is it really supposed to be all that different for us? Isn't Jesus still now the ascended Lord? The only thing that's changed is a little bit of time that has elapsed between them and us. Isn't Jesus still fulfilling his mission in the world through his church? Isn't the spirit that's going to fall in chapter 2 meant to only intensify our passions for Christ? Meant to only increase our zeal? Meant to only give us more effective ministry than theirs? It's really not all that different for us. Let us be consumed with Jesus and what he might do. Let us be consumed by Jesus and what he will do. Because God is on the move through Jesus, his spirit, in his people, for the advance of the gospel throughout all the world to the ends of the earth, through people like us. I think that's a timely word for us this morning as football season kicks off. For Jesus' fame and glory, we can like and enjoy football. God created sports. God created it, and so we can, for his glory, like and enjoy football. We can honor the code and not share the scores of the game here at church. We want men to come to the church, right? We're reaching out to men. We can honor the code and not share the scores with anybody. Do you understand what I'm saying here? We can honor the code, right? But let us not be consumed with it. Let's not simply think about passes and rushes and receptions and scores. Rather, let's think about prayer and renewal and revival and salvation. Let us be consumed with Jesus in all of life. So you might not know God's will for your life. You might not know what direction to go in a decision that you have to make. You might have a desire for service in God's kingdom that isn't coming to fruition yet. Do what they do. Take it to prayer. Take it to prayer. Lift it up to God with expectancy. Take it to your brothers and sisters in the church. You can pray alongside of of you as you pray. Because what we know is true. God is sovereign, good, and wise. And God is on the move still, And God hears the prayers of his saints and he's eager to answer them. So let's pray. May our waiting on God in all of its facets, individually and corporately, drive us into a dependency that leads us to pray. Secondly, this waiting unifies. This prayerful waiting unifies the brothers and sisters. Now, Luke goes on to describe who is in this room praying. And this is a diverse bunch of dudes here. You've got the big three. You've got Peter, John, and James. You've got glory seekers like the Zebedee brothers, who in Luke, also Luke 22, right after the the Last Supper, they're arguing about who the greatest disciple is among them. You've got Jesus' half-brothers. You've got his mom. You've got a house full of women. This is a very interesting, unusual collection of people gathered here. And he describes this whole scene for this purpose to tell us that all of these diverse people and all of these, diver- these different backgrounds, these people with different experiences, different challenges in their life, they have one unifying thing in common together. And that is their common vision and common worship of Jesus. All of these people are crammed into this upper room and the text says that they are with one accord, with one accord devoting themselves to prayer. They are together. Before Together 14 was ever created, they were, they were together. They were of one heart and mind. You know what blows me away when I, when I read something like this and I read the book of Acts? 
This group in the book of Acts looks an awful lot like the church today. It looks an awful lot like Grace Church today. We are a diverse bunch of dudes and dudettes. We have young, we have old, we have rich, we have poor, we have married, we have single, we have Bears, Packers, Cowboys, Steelers, Niners, Seahawks, Broncos, Cardinals fans. No Bengals because the Slonikers left. We miss them and we pray for them. Why, why, in all seriousness, why are we here together? Why are we here? Why did you show up this morning? Why are we in this room? Well, biblically, it is that we might look upon the same glorious Jesus, the same glorious gospel together, that we might gaze upon the same atonement that we share in the blood of Jesus together. Doesn't matter what sports team you cheer for. Jesus' blood has covered your sin. We are brothers and sisters. We're here because we want to see the same revival happen in our families. We want to see our children converted. We want to see our neighbors come to Christ. We want to see our friends come to know Jesus and to be rescued from their sins. We are united together in this one overarching passion to see God's mission advance. This church, Grace, is a lot like the church here in the book of Acts. If we're going to see revival happen, if we're going to see revival happen, if we're going to see revival ripple through our lives, in our families, in our church, in our city, and in our country, and in our world, it is going to begin, church, not end, but it's going to begin by praying together, being unified together in a prayers of common mission and common purpose. That's what the gospel does. It unifies us. So as we wait and as we pray, we, be, we become one. Third, waiting well, waiting on the Lord, waiting in dependency of him brings clarity for the future. It brings clarity for the future. Now this closing scene is fascinating to me. It's long. We're going to read the whole thing and then we're going to comment on it. But somewhere between the Ascension and Pentecost, somewhere in these seven days, as they are devoting themselves with one mind and one accord to prayer, waiting on God, when, when is the promise coming? As they pray, Peter stands up among the brothers and he gives a speech. So let's read it together and then we'll, we'll comment on it. Begins in verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. So this group is now this big. And said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Verse 18 begins a parenthetical notation by Luke, the author. This is not Peter's speech, but Luke now commenting. He writes, Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. Yuck. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called, in their own language, Akeldelma, that is, field of blood. Akeldama. For it is written in the book of Psalms, now this is back to, to Peter, for it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two. And they put forward two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, 
Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So what has happened here? What is, what is all this ruckus about? I mean, they were doing great, right? They were praying, they're unified, they're devoted, they're waiting on God, they're depending on, on him, they're loving each other, and bam, all of a sudden, there's, there's all this stuff about Judas that starts pouring out. What's happened? Well, well, here's what appears to have happened, and I think that this is astonishing. It appears that as the disciples are praying, and devoting themselves to God, and waiting in dependency on him, the scriptures are coming to mind. Jesus' words are coming to mind. And something gets jogged in Peter's mind. A step of action comes to mind. Something that should be done while they wait for the promise. And he remembers Psalm 69, verse 25. And Psalm 109, verse 8. And Luke 22, though not actually Luke 22, because Luke 22 wasn't written yet, but he remembers, I think, the words that happened on the night of Luke 22, which we've already referenced Luke 22's connection here with the Last Supper in the upper room and the Mount of Olives. But there was something else that Jesus said in Luke 22, I think that's in the, in the back of his mind. Jesus talked about the 12 disciples playing a role in the coming kingdom, And then he taught them for 40 days about the kingdom of God, this role that they were to judge over the 12 tribes. Luke 22, verses 28 through 30. Jesus says, You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, speaking of the same group. And I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. There is this moment of of future ministry for them. This is also an echo of what Jesus said earlier in his ministry in Matthew 19, verse 28, when he said this, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me to the same group will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So this is in their minds that there is this future connection to the 12 of them to play some role, mysterious as it might be, as to what it means for them to sit on these thrones and to judge over the tribes of Israel. And here they are praying, and how many are there of them? There's 11. There's 11 apostles. And so just as God so often does when we wait on him and when we pray, God begins to bring clarity about something that they need to do. Now, I think this is ironic because as I meditate on this text, my understanding of this particular point came last night at about 11 o'clock at night. It just became clear that this is what's taking place. I've been thinking on this for about five days. So I'm having this sort of ironic experience as I'm studying and reading, and then all of a sudden after praying, and God, I don't don't understand why this part is in here. I mean, I get what's happening, but what does this have to do with the whole connection? And, And then... God brings this to mind. He's clarifying for them their future. There was a purpose for why they were waiting that they had not yet seen, right? Because God could have ascended and sent the Spirit. There's a seven-day waiting. God had something he wanted done to fulfill his promise before he fulfills his promise. And Peter comes to it after days of devoted prayer. They had to deal with Judas' death, and Peter knows how. They need to replace Judas. So he brings clarity to two issues related to Judas. First, Jesus was not mistaken to pick Judas. Jesus was not mistaken to pick Judas. So if you can imagine, they're, they're, I mean, the closest of 12 following Jesus, one of them is the betrayer. That's got to rock your, your little band of brothers. And throw maybe into question whether or not Jesus was sovereign or whether or not this was a mistake or whether or not there was just an accident or how how did this even take place? But no, he says, brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled. 
which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. So he's looking back on the scriptures and he's seen in the Psalms, he's seen this, this prophetic connection. Now granted, if you look at the Psalms themselves, you're going to see that according to, to modern exegesis, this looks like a very loose, like how did you get Judas out of this? But the spirit of what he's trying to say flows from these two Psalms, Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate. So he goes on to explain how this field and, and he's, where Judas was at and how this field has been marked and let there be no one to dwell in it. So he's trying to say, we don't have to feel duped or tricked with what happened with Judas. God knew. God had planned it. God prophesied it through David in the Psalms. It was not outside the scope of his, his plan or his awareness. Rather, it was actually a part of the plan from the beginning as the Spirit led David to put these words in the Psalms, fulfilled in Ju- Judas, the scriptures had to be fulfilled. So God is still sovereign. But now that Judas, Judas is gone, he has to be replaced. And that's the second issue of clarity that Peter receives. So he quotes Psalm 109, verse 8. Let another take his office. Applies this to Judas. Let another take his office. They couldn't just leave it with 11 apostles. There must be 12. Now, he didn't know it at the time, but John the apostle would later pen these words as he describes the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven in Revelation 21, verses 9 through 14, listen carefully, especially to the very end. Verse 9 says, Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance, like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates, and on the north, three gates, and on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. There must be 12 apostles. Jesus is organizing a new Israel connected to him, a presentation to the world of the new covenants through and in these 12 spirit-filled men who lead God's people, the tribes of Israel in the new covenant, and so they needed one more. Judas' ministry, which had been allotted to him, must be reallocated to someone else. And so they pick another man. Two qualifications. Had to have been with Jesus since the beginning. Verse 21. Had to be an eyewitness. Had to be with him since the beginning, and had to be an eyewitness, verse 22, of the resurrection. So in other words, what they're trying to say is the person has to know Jesus, A to Z, beginning to end, his words and his deeds. Two men emerge. You've got Barsabbas and Matthias. And then they cast lots to de- make the decision. Now, lot casting was not an unprecedented practice. You can look at Proverbs 16 and 33 and 1 Samuel 14 to, talks about casting lots um, but it, it, you're not going to see casting lots after this, after the spirit falls. So as these essentially new Christians in Christ waiting for the spirit of the new covenant to come, they're still operating in some old covenant practices. They cast lots, but notice this. Even as they do that, it, it's not just like they're flipping a coin and just, you know, heads, you know, the bears win and tails, the bears win. And it's not like that at all. They are, they are committing themselves, even in the casting of lots, to this dependency upon God. You, Lord, they prayed. They ca- they're going to cast lots. You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Remember this. We are following Jesus. 
We are not our own masters. We are following Jesus. And they place themselves under Jesus' reign and under his lordship and under his sovereignty and under his providence as they cast these lots. And Matthias is chosen and the 12 have been numbered and the spirit will come in chapter 2. What do we do as we wait? How do we wait well on the Lord? We pray. We pray with expectancy. We pray with dependency. We unify around the gospel. We unify around Christ. And as we pray and as we wait, God brings clarity. Now, that doesn't mean that God had, you know, there had to be something done in order to bring the spirit. And then so, so now in your life, you're thinking, well, what, what do I have to do to get this to happen? That's, it's not the same thing. But we can wait with a posture towards God. We can wait with a posture for him to speak. Prayer so often is like an avalanche of grace. You know, an avalanche doesn't start all at once. It starts with a little bit of snow that's been stuck for a long time, slightly shifting. And that shift causes another shift and another shift and another shift. And within a matter of moments, the entire mountainside is coming down. Prayer has this effect of making an avalanche of grace. That God, as we pray and depend upon him, reveals maybe one small step. And maybe it's just keep praying. And as we walk in dependency on him, following Jesus, shows us another step. Shows us another step. The word is speaking to us. And before long, things start to shift. So I would encourage us as we hear this word today, and if you're waiting, if you're a person who's waiting, to remember a few things. Remember that Jesus is coming back. That's where the angel started. Don't stand there looking at him. He's going to come back in the same spot. So God's glory is not meant to paralyze us. It's meant to propel us into his mission by the Spirit, assured of his return. God's coming back. So we have between the first coming and the second coming to do all the work that the church is called to do. So be encouraged that God is coming back. And while we wait, sometimes we wait with tension. Let it drive you into dependency upon God. Hope that if nothing else from this word this morning, that you are filled with fresh faith to believe that God hears, sees, knows, and cares about you. So pray, go to him with your needs. As we celebrate communion, we we organize ourselves around and celebrate Christ, the one who assures us that the God that we love and trust, the God that we are following, is with us. So let's pray as we transition into communion. God, we thank you so much this morning for reminding us that though we may not have answers, Though we may not have direction, though we may be confused, you are not. You are the God who never slumbers nor sleeps. So I pray that our waiting would have an effect of deepening our trust in you, deepening our prayer to you, unifying us as a body of believers, and we pray, God, that you would bring clarity for the future in and through this time of waiting. We thank you that on the other side of Pentecost, we have the Holy Spirit who guides and leads us. So we rest ourselves in you today. God, I want to pray for anyone who this this word speaks really sharply to today, and I want to pray that you, God, would uphold them with your mighty right hand. And help us, Lord, even if we're not in a situation where we're waiting, to be strengthened for the time ahead where it will come. For your glory. In Christ's name, amen.